It is, a, it is a blessing to be here. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do here. It's 1045 by my clock, 1044. Uh, I will be walking up the stage at 1125, okay? And in that time, I'm going to talk uh, from the Word of God. I'm going to challenge you from some science. We're going to talk real about your brain. Uh, then we're going to do an altar call. The altar call is going to be a, a call for purity, sexual purity. Uh, and then I'm going to be outside and, and uh, talk to you outside in the back. Uh, whenever I go places to speak, I do an assessment. Okay, my, and my assessment is to try to figure out what the people in the room are, are there for. All y'all came here for a reason. Okay? And so I want to asses- share with you my assessment, not based on just judging you looking around. Because this is kind of a, it's not a judgment call. It's kind of based on, you know, the, the publicity and the, what the event's about. So I have to say, you know, I always ask, what do you want me to talk about? Who's going to be there? Is it going to be guys and girls? Because, because it's all guys, we can talk different than if there's women there. Can I get Amen. If there are any women in here, you will be subject to our conversation, and if it offends you, that's, your, that's on you. Can I get amen, fellas? Amen. We will take no provision for any women to hear this message. And if you are confused about your gender, God made you a man. <laughs> Don't believe the hype. You're a guy, just, you know... Try to figure it out. You're a guy. You're a guy. Uh, uh, so because it's all guys, okay, so it's now guys, and now I know guys' issues because I'm a guy, and, and then we can talk a little bit more blunt to each other. When you, if, like if I was to say right now, all of y'all are ugly, what would y'all say? Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. You, you go to a women's conference, oh, yeah. Can you imagine saying at a women's conference? Y'all are ugly. That would be the end of my talk, right? <laughs> be the end of my life. <laughs> So we're gonna, we're, we want to talk straight, um, very briefly, I'm from New York, played for the San Diego Chargers four years, uh, came out to California to play football, got, got drafted by the Los Angeles Rams in 1982, got cut by the Rams, went to play for the Chargers, did for four years, did cocaine, marijuana, first two years, got saved, stopped doing cocaine in one day, 1984 to April 12th, uh, went into ministry, amen. Went into ministry with Mike McIntosh down in San Diego, a Horizon Christian Fellowship, in 1986. Started a church called The Rock Church in 2000 in San Diego. And so if you're ever in San Diego, come visit us. And we love to get down with the Word of God, and, and we do a lot of ministry. We have, we, uh, last year we did 235,000 hours of volunteer service in the community. That's our thing. We get people out doing the work of the ministry, not just, you know, talking about it. And so that's our thing. So we're very excited. Uh, and I'm going to preach a message to you today about the worst sin there is. I do Twitter. I don't know if y'all do Twitter, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. I, I do social media. And I tweeted out one day, are all sins the same? Because in the science of tweetology, I made it up. Okay, in the science of tweetology, you could send out little messages, you know, here's what I'm doing, or, you know, pray, or encouragements. But you could also send out questions. So I sent a question out to, to Twitter, uh, all, all sins the same, and people, oh, all sins are the same, and da-da-da-da. I said, no, not all sins are not the same. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that their sins against the body are different than sins outside the body. So we're going to talk about all the, 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 the sin that will enslave you and destroy you more than any other sin. Now, before I go any further, let me, let me give you a little commercial. Uh, the message I'm going to preach today is called X-Men. Because if you do the things I'm going to talk about, you will be someone's ex. <laughs> now, another thing about being in a room full of guys, you know some guys are slow. <laughs> so I'm going to say that again a little slower. Because some of y'all are still, uh, ex. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to pause for emphasis and let it marinate. <laughs> the title of the message is called X-Men, because if you do what I'm talking about and you don't get it fixed, you are going to be someone's ex. Your relationships are not going to work out. Now, before, before I go, this, this message is part of a series called Wired for Love that I did uh, last year. And I have a, uh, a little disc, I'm going to put it up on the screen. A little, it's like a little business card. And on this card is 27 messages. And we're going to make this available to you out, out in the gazebo. I'll be out in the gazebo after. But this series called Wire for Love has 
a series of messages all on sexuality, relationships, love, all from the Word of God. Uh, what we're going to talk about today has a, a sermon for young women who've been violated, has a sermon on marriage, et cetera, et cetera. This, this also has messages on worship, uh, why bad things happen, how to be financially blessed, all according to the Word of God, and lesson plans in there as well. So that'll be out, I'll have that out there for you, and I want to see you after the service. Um, I want to pray, and I want to pray that not only what I say is clear to you, but that you receive it and that you allow God to do in your life what he wants to do. Y'all going to hear messages all day. I know you, you've been hearing the Word of God. I've been back here all morning since Chuck Smith was here. I know you're hearing a lot of information. But at some point, if you don't take that information and put it into action, you're just kind of wasting your time. Okay? And the only way you're going to know that the Word of God is having any impact on your life, it doesn't, good just to, it doesn't do you any good just to hear it. You have to actually let it transform you, and you have to do it. And so I'm going to challenge you to do it. Okay, we're going we're to call some of you guys up here. Uh, and I want to challenge all y'all who have sons. How many of y'all have a son? Okay, very good. Your sons need to hear this message and need to get that serious. Because the devil's going after your son. Some of y'all are, are going to die soon, so he's kind of almost done with you. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Your old, cut, crusty brothers all broke down. He's like, okay, I, I, I got to go get your son. And by the way, he, he's, he, the devil's after your grandson. The one that's not even born yet. The one that's not even born. The devil's very strategic. He's a mastermind. Okay? So I, I want to turn to Genesis chapter uh, 2. And while you, while you go there, I want to read something to you from 1 Corinthians. That's a good sound right there. Pages, Bible. And by the way, um, when you go to church in two days or tomorrow or tonight, some of you may have Saturday night, let me encourage you to bring your Bible. <laughs> Sounds like a little simple. I, I want to encourage you, again, fellas, right? We talking man to man? Don't walk in Bible or in church without a Bible. And if you do, I want you to have this word in your head as you're walking in with nothing in your hands. And don't make your wife carry your Bible. <laughs> carry her Bible, okay? I want you to have this word in your hand, in your head, if you walk in church without a Bible. I'm an idiot. <laughs> On the count of three, everyone say idiot. One, two, three. Idiot. Get the Bible. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, flee, everyone say flee. flee. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual sin sins against his own body. There's a big difference between stealing a Snickers bar and committing adultery. There's a big difference. They're not the same. They both deserve death, but let me tell you something. There's different levels of death. Just as when you go to heaven, everyone won't have the same experience, you will have an experience that is great, but it won't be the same. You, when you go to hell, you will have a different experience. Sins are varied. There's a big difference between you uh, lying to a five-year-old girl and molesting a five-year-old girl. Those are not the same. They're both evil. God breaks God's heart, both of them, but one is worse than the other. And then it says in verse uh, 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. By the way, fellas, listen, listen to this sound. That's steel on steel. See, some of the slow brothers, y'all missed that. So right over your head. Or you just believe that this is steel. Maybe that's what it is, okay? Doesn't belong to me. This does not belong to me. Your body does not belong to you. Okay? It belongs to God. God says, I want your body. I want you to make your body your slave. And I want you to do, make it do what I want it to do. Okay? It's not about just getting information. You've got to let the information transform your life. Okay? Turn to Genesis chapter 2. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the, the, the land, the water, the fish, everything. And then he created Man. And every, when God created everything, he said it was good. Everyone say good. good. And then he said it was very good. Say very good. Very good. And in everything he made, he made it was good. And the and, and Bible says that he made it so when he looked at it, he would see himself. 
His glory, the visible attributes of God are clearly seen by the things God made. His wisdom, his power, his love, his creativity is clearly seen in everything he made. Science is evidence of God. God made it so when you looked at science, you would, go, you would point to God. You had to say, that's awesome. Everything he made, he said, that's awesome. We pervert it. But there was one thing God made that he said is not good. Look what it says, and this is before sin. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you shall die. Uh, this is just a little parenthetical thought. that You get this for free. This is not part of the sermon, but this is just for free. It's <laughs> a little nugget. It's a little McNugget. Uh, Adam's in the garden of Eden. There's no sin, yet there are still rules. Adam's in the garden, there, there's no sin, there's no death, but still there are rules. You will never be any place where there are no rules. Even if when you go on vacation, you say, hey, well, no rules, do whatever you want, that's a rule. <laughs> no, I never thought about that. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you break the rule, something will die. Death is not only the cessation of living and moving. Death is the separation from life. But it doesn't mean you don't exist. You will never cease to exist. And you will never cease to feel and sense and know. You will always feel, sense, and know. So you will never be dead in the sense that we think dead, no life. You will be dead in the sense of being separated from God. But you will exist forever. Well, so when you see someone in the coffin, it's just that their body's not working. But they're still alive somewhere. They're either with God or in hell. So death is separate. Spiritual death or being spiritually dead doesn't mean you can't walk and talk. It just means you are separated from God. And so what God says is that if you break my rule, you are separated from me. Okay? So, but look what he says. That, again, that was just a nugget for free. If any of y'all pastors, you can turn that into five sermons. Uh, and then verse 18, here's what it says. The Lord said, it is not good. Everyone say not good. So in the, in the midst of God's creation, he wasn't finished, but he says, this is not good. He wants us to know this is not good. Look, he says, it is not good that, I, that man be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, I know some of you are going, I knew I was supposed to have a woman. There it is, right in the Bible. God says I'm not supposed to be alone. Well, uh, it's bigger than that. Why did God make man in the first place? God made man... So man, as people think, well, God made man so man can worship him. Eh, God made man so man can glorify him. Eh, God made man so he can make him look good. No, all that is true. But the real reason God made man, and it's out of love that he made man, he made man so man could enjoy what God was already enjoying. Loving oneness. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit were loving, had loving relationship and oneness. John 17, Father, that they be one as we are one. I want you to think about this because this is going to be the foundation we're going to talk about is that God made you, created you, not so you could enjoy loving oneness and loving relationships with people, by the way, not just the spouse, but with people so we can love each other. But he also created us in a way that we actually could become one. And, of course, what does the devil do? The devil wants to poison that oneness. So today I want to talk to you about how we are one. Hmm. especially with our spouses, how the devil will poison that. And in poisoning that, he'll take the, one of the most powerful things God has given us as a gift, which is oneness and intimacy, and destroy our life with the very thing God came to bless our life. Let's keep reading. Look what it says. In verse, uh, well, I'll narrate to get to, get to, get to the bottom. He, God brought him he, uh, a gorilla to be this compatible one. And, God, and, and Adam said, uh, that's a gorilla, but too hairy for me. I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. I brought him a draft, too tall, brought him a steak, and he put him to sleep. He woke up, and the Bible says he woke up, and there was Eve, and she was naked. This is where you get the word woman from, because when Adam woke up, he said, whoa, man. Now that's what I'm talking about, God. <laughs> now you're talking. <laughs> now, just as a parenthetical thought for all you X-rated brothers, uh, <laughs> It is, it is a belief and a theory, and, and, and we'll find out when we get to heaven, that Adam and Eve were clothed in light. 
there is a science called biophotonics. Biophotonics is the study of light coming out of living things. There is light coming out of you now. The younger you are, the more healthy you are, the more light comes out of you. When you get old, the light gets dim. That's why people who get really old and close to death, they look like dust. No, for real. I mean, some of you have some old people in your life. Look at their face. It's very dust-ish. Look at young teenagers. They're bright. No, for real, this is, this is true. And, it, and, and the theory is, is that when Adam and Eve, before they sinned, the light was so bright, they couldn't see their nakedness. And when they were sinned, their light was muted, and they said, whoa. So when we think of a naked woman in this context, it's not what we have a naked woman today. They can actually measure the health of fruit, and they measure the light coming out of it. Okay? So, that's, again, that's a little nugget on the side. <laughs> he put him to sleep, Adam and Eve. She said, whoa, man. And then in verse 24, these two verses, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. They were both naked, and the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Okay. How do two people become one? We understand physical oneness. And, of course, sex. Let's take it a little step further. I want you now, I want you all to put up your uh, uh, left hand. On th this is this side. Okay, this side. <laughs> God's like, uh. <laughs> So I'm helping you out. Okay. I know this is my right, but I'm going to do this for your benefit. So I'm going to say, <laughs> say left brain. Just shake your hand, left brain, right here. Okay, so I know this is my right, but I'm doing it for your benefit. Left brain, say right brain. Okay, try it one more time. Say left brain, say right brain. Okay, you can put your hands wherever they were before. God says a man and a woman are going to become one. We understand physical contact, intercourse, is oneness. Physical, emotional, mental, that's why it's so intimate and so powerful. It goes further than that. Your, right, your, your left brain processes information and stores information over time. Your left brain helps with problem solving. Your right brain experiences the here and the now. So right now, your right brain is having an amazing experience with this awesome message you're getting. It's just like, wow, wow, wow. It's firing. And your left brain is storing the information. The sound of my voice, the, the, the temperature of the room, the, what I look like, you know, the video screens, the, the band. And that's storing the information. So later on, you can retrieve that information. But your right brain is like, yes, 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 yes. And what happens is when your right brain and your left brain fire together, they wire together. And so one side of your brain fires, which is the here and now, and the long term, they wire together, and you are able to interact with that information. When you are intimate with your wife, you have your right brain firing with all the experience of the moment, the sounds, the smell, what you see, what you experience, what you feel, uh, what you feel physically, emotionally. All that is being fired right now, and the information is being stored on your left brain for later reference. You go back to your wife again, and you do it, experience it again, and you have all this information to hear now, wow, wow, and that information is stored on your left brain. And what happens is your left brain and your right brain, they will start to wire together and connect. Okay? And that means that when you, with your wife, your left brain's going to go, I know that woman. <laughs> and you will know what to do. Your wife is actually hardwired into your brain. You are hardwired into your wife's brain for good and for worse, whatever that is. And she'll remember your sounds, she'll remember your, your habits, she'll remember your touch, your voice, she'll remember your heart. She knows everything about you and that story. And the more you're with her, the more of you is actually physically in her head, stamped on her brain. Matter of fact, when you have a memory, you have a physical imprint on your brain. Are you following me? <laughs> so you got right brain, the here and now the long term on the left. Now, you have to understand that uh, sex is about pleasure. When, when, when the Bible says the two shall become one, that oneness is not only the sexual pleasure, but it's also the bonding of sex. Sex is, God intended sex not to be uh, a pleasure thing only. It is about bonding. How? In your 
brain, you have neurons called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons enable you to look into someone's eyes and to mirror their feelings. In other words, when you see someone crying and you cry, you see someone happy, that you could actually connect with that person. Do you know that all, all the animals in the, king, the animal kingdom, God made humans, one of the only creatures in the world, to mate and to be intimate face to face. You think about Discovery Channel, all the porn you see on Discovery Channel. <laughs> that it's not face to face. The animals do, don't do it face to face. Not, the intimacy is not an issue. God says, I'm going to make you face to face and you're going to be able to look in her eye and connect and have the same heart. And by the way, I want you to think about this with your spouse, that you look her in the eye. Knowing that God created you where you can connect with her heart. Because it's not about a physical act. It's about oneness. And that you can connect with your wife's heart and actually be one with her and actually look in her eyes because you know if you've been married a long time, you can look at your wife's eye, eyes and know what she's thinking. Know what she's feeling. And if you're a man, you will deal with what you know. And if you're not, you'll say, I'm going to ignore it because I don't want to deal with it. And you know what I'm talking about. God says, I can make you where you can be one. And by the way, you can look at her eyes and you know that look and you could store it in your left brain. And you know how to minister to her based on what you see, what you know in your heart. God gave you that, that ability. Oxytocin is a hormone men have a little of, women have a lot of. Oxytocin is a bonding hormone. You see women, they are very touchy-feely. They'll hug each other, hold hands, and they're just so, ah, because they have, they have a lot of oxytocin, they like to bond. Matter of fact, when a woman breastfeeds a child, the oxytocin goes up. It bonds her to the child. That's why your kids will run to your, your wife instead of you. <laughs> Who are you? Because then your, your kids in their head, they go, I remember when mommy went on that retreat, you didn't feed us. You didn't comb my hair. You didn't give us a bath. You just said, ah, yeah, yeah, okay, go get something out of the refrigerator. And we were only three. <laughs> Mom is going to take care of every little thing. And, 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 and by the way, oxytocin is a bonding hormone. What does it do? It bonds people together. Where did that come from? God says, I want you to be one. You hug someone for more than 10 seconds, the oxytocin level goes up. It bonds them together. You see women, they'll be hugging you, hug your woman. Hold your wife for 12 seconds. I, I tell my daughter, I need 10 seconds. Not, fellas, we, don't, we, don't, we ain't into the bond thing. That's why we do this. We didn't want to shake hands anymore. It's like, bam, not even a second. Uh, 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 oxytocin, God says, I want to bond you together. Uh, vasopressin is our bonding hormone. God says, I'm going to give you vasopressin. Vasopressin bonds people together. Uh, vasopressin in men is increased during your happy ending. There's a whole bunch of dudes in here going. I want to ask somebody what that means, but I don't. Who, who, who do I talk to? <laughs> you have your foreplay, and then you get into it, and then you have a happy ending. Vassal Preston and men go up during your happy ending. Why? Because God wants you to bond with that person. He doesn't want you to use that person. All this is in your head. And God says, that is your wife. That is your mate. Look what he says. The two shall become one. Huh. The two shall become one. I'm just going to give you this for free. There's, some, there's guys in here right now going, are we paying for this? Are they going to bill us? <laughs> You're going to have to think about this. The most full body ecstasy experience that we know of is our happy ending. Can I get an amen? amen. Dang. 
Okay. Y'all were paying attention on that one, okay? <laughs> I want you to think about this. It is when a man, and if it's biblically correct, a husband and his wife are one. That's when that happens. When a husband and his wife are one. Huh. And a husband and his wife are one. When we get to heaven and the bride and the groom come together, the worship you have in heaven will be a complete body experience. You will have a new body where every cell, whatever cells in our new body, will be able to at one time worship the king. God says, oh, you, wow, is right. God says, you guys, have, you humans have no idea how all this stuff is connected. And how when you are with your bride, I'm trying to show you a relationship with me and my church. How I want to be one with my church and how I want to bless my church and how I want to serve my church. And that's what you're supposed to do with your wife. Is that you are God, you are the Lord of your house. Lord, the Lord's representative in your house. That you can look at your bride and know what she feels. Know what she's struggling with and come to her aid right away because you are one. Because when she hurts, you hurt. When she's hungry, you're hungry. Not when you're hungry, hey, honey, get me some food. And when you're hungry, you say, honey, do you want some food? That you're there for her. Okay, so let's go back. We got, we got left brain, right brain. You are one with your wife. You have all this information, all this experience that's wired. Now the devil comes along. And the devil says, huh, I got some business to do. The devil introduces another woman, whether real or imagined. Because when you watch pornography, uh, those videos not only are old, they, they, they don't know you. But yet because you have mirror neurons, you can actually put yourself emotionally into the act of what you watch. And you can actually record sound and images and imagine being there, and that information goes into your brain. Your brain doesn't, doesn't know the difference between what you were actually doing and what you were watching on TV. It's just experiencing this. I mean, it actually does know it, but the, but the information, when it goes to your brain, it's still, the experience is the same. Your right brain is having this experience right now watching this pornography. Your right brain is watching, looking at a magazine, whatever it is on your phone, on your computer, wherever you go, and your right brain is having this experience, and your left brain is going, wait a minute. This is different information. This is not the person that you were with before. The, 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 the look is different. The sounds are different. The touch is different, whether it's pornography or you're committing adultery or whatever. And what your left brain does, remember, neurons that wire together, fire together. So you have your right and your left. Right? And, they, and here's your facts, long-term facts. Here's your experience now. And your right brain's having this ex new experience, and your left brain's going, hold up. That's not your wife. And what your left brain will do, it will not connect to this new experience. Your brain gets rewired. And your brain will actually not connect because your brain will say, number one, not only is that not your wife, there's too many different people. So I can't connect. Who do I connect with? And your brain will actually re rewire itself. And what happens is your, your rewired brain, there is no bonding. Now sex is all about pleasure. And because you have no more bonding going on, remember the Bible says the two shall become one? There's no more oneness. You have a void that all the pleasure in the world will never satisfy. So you need more pleasure. You need it more frequently. You need it more risky. And all the things that happens with pornography. I can't remember the stat that the brother said about pornography, but my stat is 60% of brothers watch pornography. I'm sorry. It was 60% of pastors. Regular population. Oh, dang. Your brain's being wired. Your son's brain is being rewired. And what happens is now your rewired brain, because remember, it, it was about God said, I want two to become one. The bonding element is gone. Now it's all about pleasure. And what does your brain tell you? Now does your brain tell you that every woman you see is a pleasure object, is an opportunity for pleasure. And when women say hi to you, how you doing? Your brain says she wants to have sex with me. <laughs> I told that in a, in a, in a co-ed environment, and the guys laughed, and the women were like, oh, what, what? And I said, ladies? They're laughing because they know it's true. 
They're not laughing because it was ridiculous. Now, some of you ladies out there may think it's ridiculous. When you ladies go, hi, hi, give me a hug. <laughs> this could be a moment for give me an amen, but I don't want to do that. The devil just enslaved you. Remember the re- 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 verse I wrote? Uh, oh, well, let me read this. Tell you this verse. Uh, John 8, 34. He who commits a sin is a slave. You are a slave now. Your brain is rewired to program you to sin. You can't just turn it off. You can't. You're a slave. And you, you will leave work to go watch pornography. You will flirt with women and talk with women and hug women with your mind going crazy. A kid came up to me at our school one day. We did chapel. We have a school at our church, and he, and he, he was coming out of chapel during the day, seventh, eighth grader. Never saw the kid in my life. The kids were walking out. We were in the lobby of the church, and he goes, hey, pastor. I said, what? He says, uh, is masturbation a sin? I was like, it kind of caught me off guard. You know, what just what came out of it. <laughs> just wasn't what I was expecting. And I, you know, I, I was taken back for a second. I kind of looked bewildered, like, you know, Hi. <laughs> but he just, matter of fact, you know, hey, and, and he thought my reaction was due to the fact that I didn't know what masturbation was. So he proceeded to tell me all the different words that you could use to describe masturbation. You know, and he started just going down. The, I said, brother, I know what masturbation means. <laughs> so he says, well, is it a sin? I, and I was like, I had to re- re- regroup. And I said, I says, what are you thinking about when you masturbate? That's the sin. That's the problem. Is that your head is over here. You are sinning in your mind. Fellas, the devil says, God says, I want you to be one with one person. That is plenty. That's plenty. The devil says, no, I want to give you more. And what he does is he actually will rewire your brain. And now your brain, you are enslaved to a brain that will never be fulfilled, ever, because you have no bonding. One of the, one of the great tragedies of the, of the gay movement is, is the promiscuity. The partners and partners, especially with the men, the partners and partners and partners and partners, and they're never going to have that that emptiness that God put in their heart for bonding. But that, that is something that some of y'all need to say, Lord, you need to go to that new man thing, that, that new man curriculum. You need to get it because the Bible says if you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, don't be conformed to the world, but your mind can actually be renewed and transformed. How? By praying. Praying will actually rewire your brain and correct it. Memorizing the word of God committing scripture to memory, thinking on things that are praiseworthy and excellent and good and, excellent, and, 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 and that your brain will actually start to pro- work properly. But you have to say, Lord, I need my brain renewed. I need my soul renewed. I need to make my body a slave. Paul says he, made his, he put, uh, put his body under subjection and made it his slave. Then when he said to go right, his body went right. When he said to go left, his body went left. When he said, no, I will not, wa- this is now us, I will not watch that video. When my mind, when my eyes want to look left, I'm going to say no. My neck has no authority over me. It has no authority over me. It can't turn unless I will it to. One of the things we all love about athletes, I don't know if we know it, is that we love warrior spirits. We love to see people overcome. I don't know about you. One of the things I love about the Olympics is hearing the stories of the people who overcome stuff. I mean, whether a girl or a guy. And these people who just say, I am not going to accept defeat. I get hurt, I'm going to rehab back, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to win a gold medal. I mean, I, I, I cry all the time with those stories. And it could be something as so simple as some lady who rides a bike, but she overcame a beast in her life. She was a warrior. And God is saying, look, if you're going to follow me, you are at war. The devil, he does not care. He wants you dead. And he wants you to die a slow, painful death because the longer he can keep you alive and the longer he can get you to sin, the more people he, you can take down with you. 
And so you got to say, no, Lord, I am surrendering. I want to be a man of God. I want to be a pure man of God. And I realize that the devil has poisoned my life. And it's not something I'm just going to will away. I'm not something I'm going to pray away necessarily. I got to work at this and obey God and be transformed again. I got to have God transform my life. People say, well, I'm going to get saved and I'm going to eat anything I want. Yeah, you're going to get fat diet and you're going to go to the grave with diabetes. Just because you're saved don't mean God's going to heal everything. You got to do something. And all y'all know what I'm talking about. Matter of fact, you know what happens in your brain when you, when, you, when you cheat on your wife? When your left brain realizes that your right brain experience is not your wife, your left brain will actually release cortisol, which is a stress hormone, guilting and ratting you out. You'll let, this is the glory of God. God set it up this way. God says, I want you to be one, and I'm going to protect you. I'm going to try to warn you. From being, by trying not to be one, and when you cheat on your wife or your wife cheats on you, I'm going to release a cortisol that's going to stress you out, and you're going to be like, and your wife's going to come back, what's wrong, honey? Uh, uh nothing. <laughs> I was reading, I got these list of jokes from transcripts from a court hearing, so I, I'm going to try to remember it, but it was something like this. They were, they, they, they were deposing or inter- uh, questioning a woman. She says, so, and, I, and I'm assuming she did something to her husband. Let's, let's assume she killed her husband. Let's just assume. I don't know what, that, what it was about. It's just, it just this one line. She said, the attorney said to the witness, uh, ma'am, what was the first thing your husband said to you when you woke up in the morning? Uh, witness, she, my husband said, how you doing, Cindy? And the, the attorney said, well, why was that a big deal? She said, my name is Susan. Women, when they found out their wives were cheating on them, said, I knew something was wrong. It was his brain ratting him out because he violated the design of God. Some of y'all are violating the design of God, and you will never win that battle. It will destroy you. It will take you down. In a minute, we're going to pray. My time is almost up. And I'm going to ask you guys who want to be sexually pure, this does not belong to me. Your body does not belong to you. Glorify God in your body. You can come to church all you want, but if you go home and do the dirty, this, you're just a hypocrite. I don't know if you know Ron Jeremy. Uh, don't raise your hand. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw him last night. I saw him last night, yeah. yeah. Ron Jeremy is a porn star. He's made over 3,000 films. He's a personal friend of mine. Okay? I had him at our church. He's not saved. He's 60, 50 something. He's still active, but he's older, so he's not doing as many films. I had him out of church on our stage, five services on one Sunday, and don't judge me uh, because that's a sin. <laughs> I had him out of church for this reason. I, we were doing a series on uh, how the evil in our heart is exposed when we judge people. So I brought him up and I said, Ron, uh, you're not a Christian, you're Jewish, you, you're a porn star, you, you know, 3,000 women or whatever it is. Uh, how have Christians not loved you right? We just want to know. We don't want to choir preach to the choir. You tell us. And, and I said, I said, one out of every two of you guys out there uh, watch pornography. One out of every six women watch pornography. By the way, if you watch pornography with your wife, both of you are taking multiple partners in the bed. You're not having, you're not making love to each other. It's all a fake. You're making love with who's in your head. So I said, one out of every six women, one out of every two guys, and the day that pornography is watched more than any other day is Sunday. So, Ron, you, you, you uh, engaged in pornography. We just want to know how people loved you. And by the way, uh, Ron's not the hypocrite in this room at all. He's being who he is. Y'all are the hypocrites. Because some of y'all come and, hey, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and then you go home and watch your video. So don't be judging him or don't be judging me. Get your act together. In a minute, we're going to pray. Amen. In a minute, we're going to pray. First Corinthians 6, 18, flee. Everyone say flee. flee. Run, forest, run. <laughs> F- no, really, run. In a minute we're going to pray, you got to say, Lord, I, I don't want to be a fool to think that I can do this and get away with it. Because I cannot. You cannot. 
and you know the thoughts you have in your mind, you know the thoughts that consume your, your mind, you know what you think when you see women, when you engage women, when you see your wife, when you see videos, you know that is the problem. Has nothing to do with you the fact that you're not murdering people. God wants you to have an intimacy with one person. And so in a minute, we're going to pray, and you're going to have an opportunity to say, Lord, I'm ready to be pure. Some of you may have no, you've never done anything with this. You still need to be pure. Because the devil, he will get you like this when you ain't looking. 